Thank you, Miss Patsy. We're in First Peter, the fifth chapter, and guess what verse we're in? Yes, verse seven. <laughs> Six and seven. He wanted me to let you all know that we're having services Sunday, uh, and we will have communion for service. We will not be having the dinner on the grounds. He said he's doing better. And appreciates our prayers and Peggy and several others who from our church that are been hit with the virus. Um, they're recovering. Most of them have been mild case, but you know it, there's a lot of coughing and congestion and respiratory distress with it, whether it's the chest or sinuses. So let's remember quite a few of our folks in prayer <coughs> who are. Uh, are going through this time with that. There are some other prayer requests I'd like for you to begin to remember. David Atkins will be having major surgery on his neck uh, coming up the 14th of July. Please remember him in prayer. And also uh, the 6th of July, my great-granddaughter Eliza will have major surgery to reconstruct the palate or to build a palate in her mouth. Eliza. E-L-I-Z-A, Eliza Jane. So um, remember her in prayer. Are there others that you want to mention? Well, thank you for being here, and we welcome those of you who are listening tonight via the Internet. We pray that the, our class will be a blessing to you. We need to take a few moments to prepare ourselves for the study of God's Word tonight. So with that in mind, let's do that. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege of coming together and being able to study your word tonight. Thank you for those that are here as well as those who are, will be studying with us via the YouTube internet. We thank you for that opportunity we have to share the word of God with them and with all who you bring to that site. We leave that in your hands to do so. We do commend to you those from our church who are going through periods of illness, some having surgery. We pray you superintend in all of that. For those who have already had it, for healing, for those who have it pending, that you would uh, grant wisdom uh, as the doctors operate, that it might accomplish that which is needed to be done. We pray, Father, for little Eliza that uh, you would bless her now in this difficult surgery. Uh, it's going to be tough and painful, and we just pray, Father, for you to work in that on her behalf. Now we're here to study your word tonight, Father. We're here because we recognize that your word, living and alive in our lives, is the only hope for this nation. We recognize that we're on a slide going down. It's slick, and we're gaining momentum. And yet we ask you, if it can be your will, that you would intervene, and that for the sake of right, the righteous ones, that you would cause things to turn around. But tonight, we pray for you to give us illumination, clarity of thought, clarity of speech, Spiritual understanding of what we're going to study, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as you know, we're in paragraph, the second paragraph of 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. And that paragraph started in verse 5, which said, You younger men, speaking to the congregation of a local church, likewise be subject to your elders, that is your pastor, teacher. All of you, enclose you clothe yourself with humility, toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, that's the command, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares, your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Now, here's how, what you're going to do in order to function as a resistance force in verse 9 which says resist Satan. 
you're going to casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Now be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith or in the faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Now we are looking at verses 6 and 7, which the command was to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And then you have in verse 7, casting all your anxiety upon him. Now, the action of these verbs are actually flipped because you are casting your anxiety upon the Lord. He is able to promote you, exalt you at the proper time. Now, we are to be adorned, it says, with humility. We're to have humility become a part of our life. And the result of us casting our cares upon the Lord will be that He's going to be able to build humility in each of our lives. God is able to promote that individual or any of us because we consistently cast our, our anxieties, our cares, the pressures that we face in life, which are normal. We cast these circumstances on the Him. And He's glorified in that. And He's able to bless us in that. Now we see that for... If we're diligent to cast our burdens upon the Lord, there are about three traits that will be evident in our lives. One will be we will be grace-oriented toward one another and, and toward uh, those about us. It will demonstrate the fact that God is that we're God dependent rather than self dependent. And if we're consistent in casting our cares on Him, it demonstrates that we trust God's sufficiency to work on our behalf. You know, so many times we think we can solve all our, our own problems. <laughs> and I'm not saying that we can't. But we shouldn't do it apart from God. God may use us, give us wisdom to how to deal with solving our own problems. But we cast it upon Him and say, we want you to take this. And he'll show us what to do or how he goes about doing it. Well, let's look at some examples. You remember about an uh, uh, Old Testament character that was adorned with humility. So much so that there was no one like him. Who was that? Moses. Moses. You know, he was in line for the throne of Egypt. He was supposed to replace Tutmos the first. He was a brilliant military commander. He was renowned for his architectural skills. Built beautiful edifices. And then he renounced the throne. And purposed to free the Hebrew people from the slavery of Egypt. And Tutmos II, third rather, the, the reigning Pharaoh at the time that Moses did that renunciation, had Moses' name removed throughout the whole land. He wanted him to be a forgotten person. He wanted to obliterate the very memory of Moses. And you know, when I was thinking of that, it's always been Satan's plan to obliterate <laughs> his people. He wanted to obliterate the Jews. Tutmos III tried to wipe out the name of Moses. He actually literally had him removed from the buildings that were they were engraved in. And the thought came to me in Psalm 2. Remember that verse that says God sits in the heavens and laughs? And I just thought, isn't that funny? Here, Tutmos III, you know a whole lot about him? No. <laughs> Do you know a lot about Moses? Yes. 
He tried to wipe out the thought of Moses, but God sits in the heavens and laughs. And who is it that we remember? Moses. Look at Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 24 through 27. Why Moses is installed in the hall of faith. Hebrews 11, by faith. Now that's not talking about his personal faith. This is talking about his understanding of the word of God, of truth. Because of truth, you can say, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the, plas- the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, and that's what this whole fifth chapter and fourth chapter of Peter, First Peter was talking about, the reproach of Christ, suffering for the reproach of Christ. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By means of truth, doctrine, by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. God had greater plans for Moses than to be an earthly pharaoh. It would be through Moses that the law would be given. Nations would be founded, have an opportunity to found their governments on the laws of, that Moses gave. It was the law that would reveal the sinful condition of mankind and the need of a Savior. And it was the gospel message that became known throughout the whole world of that day of Moses at the hand of God dividing the waters. Remember? He was, became the human instrument to carry the good news that the God of Israel, the pre-incarnate Christ, could do something that no one else could do. Numbers, the 12th chapter. In the first eight verses, you know any time that a person is taking a stand for the Lord, and we're going to see that in our lesson tonight, and being used in a very mighty way, they're going to have opposition. Sometimes that opposition comes from strangers, but more often it comes closer to home, sometimes within the family. Then Miriam, his sister, and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. Well, that sounds like they were very grace-oriented, wasn't it? They didn't like the woman he married. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? Hmm. And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble. More than any man who was on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, You three come out to the tent of meeting. How's that for a telegram from heaven? You come out here, I want to talk to you. So the three of them came out. That's a good idea. I'm glad they did that. They had a chance to walk out instead of be carried out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent and he called Aaron and Miriam. And When they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. That's how God spoke in Old Testament times to prophets, in a vision, dreams. I shall speak with him in a dream. Oh, well, that was what the next verse said. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly. And not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant 
against Moses. Well, as you know, the result of that, there were consequences for what they did. Miriam, for one, was struck with leprosy. It's interesting that Stephen, remember the first martyr of the church? We have a record of him in Acts, the seventh chapter. Now, Stephen's going to preach a message before he, they kill him. You know, do you have anything to say? He said, let me tell you. <laughs> and he made it a good long speech, not because he was avoiding death, but he was going to give the gospel message out once again. And notice what he mentions in Acts 7, verse 36. This man led them out, reference to Moses, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, and this is a prophecy, God shall raise up for you a prophet like me for your brethren. And that he was quoting, Stephen was quoting Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter and the 18th verse. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers. And he received living oracles to pass on to you. So we see that even in the New Testament, in the early church, in the first century, they were still remembering the work of Moses and how God had used Moses. Now let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment and see how Mo the message, the gospel message of what God, the God of Israel was able to do at the Red Sea, how it affected the heathen nations. And go with me to Joshua the second chapter, Joshua, the second chapter, I knew I had a slide on that, folks, I'm sorry I didn't turn it, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 11, Joshua, the second chapter, verses 8 through 11, now here we come across a lady, she's a very great lady, she had a great reputation, Rahab. I've always enjoyed the study of Rahab because when you grow up in a legalistic church and they would always emphasize how the scriptures would always say Rahab the harlot. And it does. To let you see what the grace of God can do in a person's life. Rahab responds to the gospel message of God's deliverance by hiding the two spies. You recall? She, he sent a a team in to check out the territory, a reconnaissance team, and she hid these two spies. Why did she do that? Well, look at verse 8. Now, before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you in the, uh, in the land. Now, you remember the intelligence unit of in, in, uh, uh, where Rahab was, had already noticed that two strangers came into town. It's like watching Matt Dillon's movies. I love them. So they want to know where they've gone. Where are they? And before these, these two men that she's hiding are going to be bedded down in the stacks of flax, she, ta she tells this, I know the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the sea. The waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted, 
and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God. Now here's the testimony of a believer. He is the God in heaven, above, and on earth, beneath. She became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember she had them put the twine, the red twine, to spare her and her family when they destroyed, came into the land and destroyed Jericho. They made that promise to her. Well, that's one time Rahab's mentioned. That's enough to be in the Bible. One time. But no. She's the exalted, remember? Here, this is a woman who is a picture of humility, of grace. And God is going to exalt her. And what greater exaltation? She is the great, great grandmother of David. And she's forever in the word of God in the lineage of David and of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, verses 5 and 6. And to Salmon, who was born Boaz, by Rahab. Ah. And to Boaz was born Obed, by Ruth. And to Obed, Jesse. And to Jesse was born David, the king. So there we have another mention of her. That's two times. Well, we go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and lo and behold, there she is in the hall of faith. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in the 31st verse, by faith, her knowledge of the word of God, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And then a fourth time in the scriptures, in James, the second chapter, in the 25th verse, Rahab demonstrates her faith in the pre-incarnate Christ, the God of Israel. Remember, as she protected the spies sent by Joshua. And in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? It's a shame that this verse is taken and twisted by those who teach salvation by works. And they'll quote this verse. Was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works? Sure she was, but not for salvation. It was a demonstration of her salvation. Remember the book of James, when you study James, remember James is written to believers. It says Abraham was justified by faith when he offered Isaac. Is that what saved him? No, he was already a believer. What is it? It's a demonstration of his faith that he offered Isaac. And this was a demonstration of Rahab's faith. It showed that she was legit in her faith, in her spiritual life. By doing what? Not for salvation. She was already saved. But by what she did to hide the spies. Well, let's look at David. We saw Moses was a man of humility. Stephen was a man of humility. We saw that how Rahab repeatedly comes into the word of God in Scripture, and here we have David in 1 Chronicles, the 29th verse. He's the greatest king probably that ever was on the earth. He will be honored in the millennial kingdom and, and again sit on the throne over Israel. He was a humble person. Verse 10 says, First Chronicles 29, verse 10, So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed art thou, O Lord, God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, thine is the dominion. 
O Lord, and thou dost exalt thyself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from thee, and thou dost rule over all, and in thy hand is power and might, and it lies in thy hand to make great and to strengthen every one. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I? Who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from thee. And from thy hand we have given thee. For we are just sojourners before thee. Tenants, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow. There is no hope. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build thee a house for thy holy name, it is from thy hand, and all is thine. Now see, David could have gotten credit for all that. When Solomon came to rule, he had 40 years of peace, courtesy of his father. His father defeated all the enemies around him. He had all the materials that it was necessary to have to build the temple, courtesy of his fathers. The plans, the design, everything. And yet David said, look, it's all from you, God. It's all from the Lord and God of Israel. Humility. God was able to exalt, exalt, uh, exalt him above all the kings of the earth. Why? Because of this next verse. Casting your cares, all your anxiety, upon him. Now, remember in our last class, which we looked again at verse 7, we saw that casting our cares is the word, our cares is marimna, marimna. In our context, in our context, rather than just in general. In relation to what Peter is writing, he is referring primarily to the persecution that the Christians of his day are experiencing. And he's going to tell them to cast their cares upon the Lord. And he's saying, now that's going to be a prerequisite, a prerequisite for God to be able to use you, to promote you, to exalt you. That's why I said earlier to you that the action of verse 7 has to occur before verse 6 can take place, the Lord exalting. You have to develop, I have to develop, the spiritual skill of casting our cares, our burdens on the Lord. And as we do that, we become adorned, dressed in humility, covered in humility. We can become grace-oriented. We no longer look at people to see who is better and compare and am I better than this and what they've done and so forth. We have a different attitude. In casting our cares and in our anxieties on Him, we demonstrate our dependency upon Him. You know, when you and I cast our burdens on the Lord, you know what we're saying? We're not able to do it. <laughs> we're not able to handle it. We're dependent upon you. We are inadequate for this. And that causes us to be occupied with him. That causes us to be occupied with what he wants to do on our behalf. See, it's always on our behalf. That's the key. He just doesn't work. He works on our behalf. And we have the opportunity to trust him. You remember the principle, huh? When you rest, God works. When you decide to do the work, God rests. When you try to take your problems and handle them yourself, God doesn't interfere. But when you cast it upon him, he works. And we enter into his rest. You know, there's a difference in... Now, I'm, we're going to get to this. We do have responsibilities 
concerning we cast our burden to the Lord, but that doesn't absolve us of a certain responsibilities. Okay? But you know, when we decide to go our own way, remember Isaiah, each has gone to their own way. You have to admit, and I do too, if, if we're honest, the outcome is iffy, isn't it? We're not so sure that it's going to work out. We might come, especially, you know, at night when you lay down in bed, and you solve that problem 4,000 or more ways. You stay up all night, you wake up in the morning, just, I'm just beat. Why didn't I sleep? And you can't think of one solution that you had come up with the night that you didn't sleep. You've forgotten them all. Well, see, God wants us to sleep. <laughs> the psalmist says, I laid down, I went to sleep, and the Lord sustained me. I woke up. <laughs> we could say refreshed. Because it's in his hands. So you and I have to make some decisions, folks. There's points of decision in our life concerning spiritual things. You remember, you had to make a decision to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You had to believe that on the cross he died for your sins, that he was buried and that he rose again, that he is God in the flesh, and that by simple faith in him and that alone, you have eternal life. You're imputed the righteousness of God. You become a child of God and 40 other things along with it. Then you have to make another decision. There's that decision, well, I'm saved. Now am I going to punt and, or am I going to grow? Am I going to grow in the, word of, in the knowledge of the Word of God? Am I going to grow in my spiritual life? Or do I already have my life insurance policy, spiritually speaking? And that's all I really was after anyway. Sad. Some people do that. We have to make the decision to pursue to follow, to obey the mandates of the Word of God so that we can grow. And then comes life. You know, just because I'm a Christian, life didn't get easier. In fact, for some reason, could it be that we just acquired an enemy when we became a believer in Christ and things get a little tougher? Yep, that's what it is. You see, before we were saved, we did not have an enemy in the adversary in Satan. We were in his camp. You say, oh, I wasn't bad. We're not talking about good, bad. We're talking about a person without Jesus Christ is of the flesh. Jesus said in 840, John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. You're without Christ. You're either with Christ or without Christ. If you're without Christ, you're a child of Satan, of the flesh, ruled by your sin nature. You have to make a decision. Am I going to grow? And then am I going to cast my burdens? Because now I have a real enemy, and we're going to see that as we continue in uh, this fifth chapter. We now have an enemy that we didn't have before. And are we going to cast those burdens and those pressures that he brings into our life on the Lord? Or are we going to cast them? We're going to do something with them. You know that. Are we going to just lay them upon ourselves and try to solve it and really fail in, at every turn in doing so? So the direction in which we cast our anxieties is very important. But you have to cast it to the right person. It can't be to self. It has to be to the Lord. Now, when you don't do that right, guess what happens? Instead of rest coming into your soul, stress comes into your soul. Hmm? 
Every time. And it opens up all kind of other sins. You become preoccupied with yourself. You, come, you become preoccupied with the problems. You start looking for somebody to blame. You start looking to justify why you shouldn't be having the problems you're having. And your problems and pressures become absorbed in your soul. And all kind of reactionary sins follow. Always happens that way. Or, you can do the biblical alternative. Remember the old song? Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. And He'll provide the work. He'll do the work. He'll provide the rest. And it'll be a rest that is free from self-pity, free from bitterness, anger, malice, anxiety, stress. It's pressure. It's real. But you don't let it come into your soul and become a controlling factor in your soul. And when we have that attitude and we be, when we take that perspective to the problems that come in life, it demonstrates humility of the soul. And God is able to promote the believer in his service. Now, failure to rest brings stress. Failure to rest brings stress. Now, it should be noticed, and I mentioned this earlier, Casting our anxieties on the Lord does not relieve us of certain responsibilities. And Peter's going to address these in the next verses. He's going to say, you need to have a sober spirit. You need to be diligent. You need to be on the alert against the schemes of, the Satan, of Satan. Now, I'm not going to try to develop the concept of stress in the soul tonight. I'm going to refer you to this little booklet. I hope you have one by now. On stress is optional. It's one of the later publications uh, that has just come off the press by our pastor Pete Daughtry. It's well worth your reading. It's, it's, so, it's so valuable for the time in which we live. For those of you who are listening over the airways, uh, internet, it's available on our website. You go to the Albany Bible Church website, click on media, downloads, and you'll see that listed with the other book pamphlets that are, look, are available. And you can have a di it's an, in digital form on our website. Now, if you want a hard copy, there's a place there for you to fill it out and to submit it, and the church will be glad to mail it to you. No charge, of course. Postage paid, and no uh, charge for the materials. All right, let's get back to our text now. Back to verse 7. Why is it so important? Why does God want us to cast our cares, our anxieties upon him? Because he cares. It matters to him what we're going through. That's a beautiful thought. The word is melai. He cares. Anxieties. Present tense. He always cares. There's never a time that he doesn't care. However, notice something. Notice here on the screen, you'll see that the word melai, and, and my, for some reason it, it's out of, Melai should be right there under cares in blue. Notice that word is different than anxiety up top. Both words can be translated cares. But this one down here is different. It's better to translate it because it matters to him. Present tense. It always matters to him. 
There's no place for the believer to ever say, does God care what's happening to me? There's no place for a believer to say that legitimately because he ever cares. Now, when we take our burdens to the Lord, if we leave them there, what are we demonstrating? Well, you're demonstrating confidence in the Lord, aren't you? And you're not doubting that he can do the job on your behalf. Remember James says that we're to, to not doubt? You're committed to the Lord without doubting, knowing that he's going to care. Remember he, he told Israel he cared for them. He told Israel they're his people. Has he demonstrated it since the time of Moses, the founding of the nation to the present day? He still cares for Israel. Nobody's able to wipe them off the map. We have states that are multiple times larger than the state of Israel. One of our smallest states would compare with it. I think it's only a couple hundred miles long. <laughs> the whole country. And yet it gets more attention than any nation in the world. Oh, it just happens that way. No, <laughs> it's a God thing. <laughs> Be sure of that. They're his people. Look at Deuter Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter. God made a promise to Israel. Now, you see, when God makes a promise, it's, you can go to the bank with it. Because his word is irrevocable. God cannot lie. In Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter, verse 11 and 12. But the land into which you are about to cross to possess it, a land of hills and valleys, drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning even to the end of the year or the age. Secondly, God cares for those who are his because you're his child. Look at Matthew, the sixth chapter, in chap verse 25. You and I have logistical needs. And look what the scriptures say. In Matthew 6, 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious. Don't get stressed out for your life as to what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? But, verse 33, have the right perspective. But seek first the, his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all the things that you weren't to be anxious about in verse 25. Shall be added to you. <laughs> so you see you were worried and I was worried about where the next. I'm going to have to preach to myself today. Because just, I waited a little late to print out my lesson, this lesson. And the printer was just kicking it out. And all of a sudden on page 8, it started on 13, working back. I didn't see any ink on the paper. No ink in the printer. 5.15. I said, I'm going to run to office depot. The shelves empty for 901 HP ink. That's the model I had to have. No 901. Stacked with 902s, 904s, everybody else's. No 901. She says, there are no 901s anywhere that I know of. I said, well, what do I do? 
She said, well, maybe just try Target or Walmart, you know, or Staples. And I said, well, I didn't know Target sold it, but I'll go there. They're close. I went to Target and looked. Shelves mostly bare, too, except for those numbers, everybody else's number. And I started just digging 901. Found one. But I have to tell you, my stomach had turned already four or five times. <laughs> See how easy it is to get a little stressed? I, I already said, how, how do I put a laptop up here? And then we're on YouTube and you can't see. And, and my mind was just going. <laughs> God had it all worked out. I said, well, I found one. Let me look a little bit more. And I dug the all in the way in the back corner of the shelf. It was another 901. I said, thank you, Lord. I'll take both of them. <laughs> and that's it for 901s. No more. She said, we can't get them. I guess it's part of baby food. Well, don't be anxious, Harry, for class. <laughs> Actually, for tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. And it did. Here we are. I've got a printed lesson, and it's everything's working. I had to remember, should apply what I was getting ready to say sooner, and I wouldn't have had a little tummy, butterflies in my tummy. Matthew 7, 11. God's provision in times of want. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to you who seek him? See, the Lord already knows our need. He said the righteous will not go begging. In Peter's second epistle, which we haven't gotten to, but we will eventually, in the first chapter, right off the bat, verses 2 and 3, you're very familiar with it. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our Jesus, and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life, that's our physical life, and godliness, our spiritual life, through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. In other words, God already knows everything we're going, that we need and he's already made provision for that. Where does that leave us in the stress <laughs> arena? It shouldn't put us there at all. We should not be in it. And then when you go to Ephesians, the third chapter, <laughs> God's power is greater than what we can even think. Pete would say dream, you know. Here's where he gets that. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly uh, beyond all that you can ask or think, dream, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, not just to one, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So this leads us to faith rest, because that's what casting our cares upon him does. And I've tried to come up with a, a little formula that helps us. I call it C plus C plus C equals R. The first C refers to claim. We're to claim a promise. Pick one. You got over 600 to choose from. Pick one appropriate. You pick to a promise and learn it. Make sure you learn it. It doesn't do any good to be on, on the, you know, on the uh, table in the living room, open Bible, but you don't know what, it, what, it, what the contents are. Just gathering dust. Learn a promise. Claim that promise by faith. That's what Jeremiah had to do in Lamentations, the third chapter, verses 21. This I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope, confidence. Now, I want to say this. Sometimes I don't recall things very well to mind, and maybe you don't either, okay? If we get older, we tend to forget more and more. But be encouraged. 
We're not talking about the physical life. We're talking about spiritual things. And Jeremiah could recall to mind because God the Holy Spirit was in him. Recalling to him the word of God that was, he wasn't indwelt because that's Old Testament. But he was walking with the Lord, shall we say. And the Lord brings to his attention a promise. Here it is. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. And his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So you claim that promise. You've learned the promises of God. You maybe have a promise notebook that you've kept a log of promises and prayers that you've claimed and you've seen God answer. It's a wonderful idea. And then you connect that promise to the character of God, to the essence of God. That's the rationale. His plan. His provision for you. Isaiah, the 40th chapter. Excuse me just a moment. I think my printer did me. Isaiah 40, 28 and 29. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might. He increases power. Have you not heard that? Have you not read that? Did you not learn that? Well, if you have, then you claim that and you relate that to what he is able to do. He doesn't grow tired. His understanding is beyond comprehension. What did he tell Mary in Luke, the first chapter, and 37th verse? Remember the pregnancies of Mary and Elizabeth? There's Elizabeth way past the age of childbearing. Mary, not even Mary, doesn't have a husband, never has had a relationship with a, a, a man. She says, how can these things be? The answer is what? Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. About 1 John 4.4. 4. You are from God, little children. You've overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So based on these rationales, you can make a conclusion. That's the third C. So you claim, you connect, and you conclude that he's greater than anything that you're facing. He's greater than anything I'm facing. And we throw upon him our care. And we're confident that it matters to him because we matter to him. Don't you just love Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses six and seven? Stop worrying about anything, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which is beyond human comprehension, beyond that which the human mind can comprehend, shall guard, garrison, shall guard, shall build an Alamo, I, my own interpretation around your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, never apart from Christ Jesus. How about Psalm 9, verse 10? And those who know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, O Lord, has not forsaken those who seek thee. Psalm 56, 4. In God, whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust I shall not be afraid. 
What do we tell the little children, remember? In what time I'm afraid, what? I will trust in thee. Psalm 62, 8. Trust in him at all times, O peoples. Pour out your heart before him. That's casting your burdens to the Lord. God is a refuge for us. And Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 7, Blessed is the man, happiness to the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. Well, the result of casting our cares on Him is that we rest. God gives us inner peace, tranquility of soul, fellowship with Him in our human spirit. And we see and can enjoy and can appreciate and can be blessed as we see God work. And remember, it's always on our behalf. Even in discipline, God works on our behalf. Have you ever thought of that? Even in disciplining us, He works on our behalf. He's never our enemy. We can become an enemy of Him. He's not our enemy. I'll just remind you of a hymn and we're going to close with this. Francis Havergal wrote in the mid-1800s, Stayed upon Jehovah. Hearts are fully blessed. Finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. We have that in our hymn, Like a River Glorious. Stayed upon Jehovah. But that's where you have to place it. You have to cast the burden in that direction upon him. He doesn't force us to. He doesn't force us to trust him. He says, I'm waiting. I desire. But it's up to us. Isaiah 30, 18 tells us that. The Lord longs to be gracious to us. Therefore, he waits he waits on high to have compassion on you for the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for Him. Well, Sunday, we'll probably move into verse 8. We will have communion Sunday and we'll begin uh, looking at 1 Peter uh, 5, verse 8, in which He's going to give us the what things we're responsible for in casting our burdens upon the Lord. There are some responsibilities that we have, and we'll look at those coming Sunday. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your grace and this time together in the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us with what we studied. We pray, Father, again for those who are not able to be with us because of illness, that you would uh, work in their lives to restore to health, and they might be able to join us again. But we're thankful for the opportunity this church has to send the message out uh, through the technology that we now have available and we pray that you would draw hearers and viewers to the word to the website that is people supposedly accidentally just browse but we know your hand is behind it that it'll be to a lesson like this if they have such a need a gospel message. Thank you for all those who are giving a true presentation of the gospel. We pray that the word of God would continue to go out in great power. And we pray, Father, that we would anticipate seeing you work in such a way that many will come to know Christ in these last days. And until then, May we be faithful, recognizing that we have the privilege of being your representative here on earth. And others are watching. May they see Christ in us and desire him as their possession. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.